The next lecture is going to be on chronic leukemias. Chronic leukemias can be broken down into two. We have chronic lymphocytic leukemia and chronic myelogenous leukemia. The first part of this lecture is going to focus on CLL, which is chronic lymphocytic leukemia. CLL is the most common type of chronic leukemia in the United States. It's very, very common. And the age group that you need to remember is it happens to patients that are older than 60 years old. Age, very, very important. Older than 60 years old. And often patients are asymptomatic. They don't have any symptoms. And this disease, we don't really know what causes it. And what typically happens is a patient will come to the doctor's office and they're going to order a test. Maybe a simple lab test. Let's just check your CBC. And their white blood cells, their lymphocytes, come back to be greater than 20,000. And you wonder, why, why, why should lymph, lymphocyte count greater than 20,000? That might be pointing to the direction of chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which is very common in the elderly. And that's the most common type of leukemia. Usually, actually, the age is even greater than 50, 50, not necessarily 60 years old. So because we don't know what the cause is, this is often due to the monoclonal proliferation of lymphocytes. They're usually mature. So this is how you remember. Remember this, a 50-year-old person is very mature, so the cell lines are going to be mature cells. So they have monoclonal, which means one clone cell, right? Proliferation means rapid growth of mature lymphocytes. So the way I think about it, yeah, you've probably grown older anyway, and the lymphocytes start to already mature anyway, and then they start to proliferate, and you have a lot of them. So therefore, you see the white blood cell count is usually greater than 20,000, but it's usually range from 50,000 to about 200,000. In general, I want you to remember that this, this disease is the least aggressive. Think about it as a mild form of any disease, of any of those leukemia. It's not as aggressive and fatal like the other like acute leukemias where you have a lot of uh, blast cells. And usually these patients survive for a very long time. They live to their 80s or their 90s and they'll probably die of something else. They're not necessarily going to die of CLL. It's because the course is usually very, very pro prolonged. So usually what are the symptoms? They are not going to have any symptoms. They're asymptomatic, and usually this is detected on routine lab work. And you go to the CBC, and they develop lymphocytosis. That is the word, lymphocytosis, when you order a CBC, which is a complete blood count. But what you will notice is a generalized painless lymphadenopathy, which is a big swollen lymph node that's not painful at all, and usually they have splenomegaly. So painless lymphadenopathy, lymphadenopathy, and a huge spleen, spleno megaly, splenomegaly. And it's usually these patients can be predisposed to infections or due to, due to their immune deficiency and in more advanced cases they're going to develop anemia and they're going to develop uh, thrombocytopenia. And if they have anemia they'll be fatigued, they might have some weight loss, you see that pale conjunctiva, you might have some skin rashes, and if they have low platelets, they might have easy bruising, just as any type of thrombocytopenic, and they have bone tenderness and abdominal pain. But usually this is an advanced disease all the way down the line. 
But there's different stages of CLL. And there's stage 0 to stage 4. So let's talk about stages of CLL. Stage 0 usually have elevated white blood cell count. Stage 1 typically have lymphoadenopathy. Lymphadenopathy. Lymphoadenopathy. Which means swollen lymph nodes. And stage 3, by that time, they start to develop anemia. I mean, stage 2, I'm sorry, is splenohepatosplenomegaly. And stage 3, they start to develop anemia. And by stage 4, they have thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia. Now let's take a look at the stages. Think of, so it starts with huge lymphocytosis, right? A lot of lymphocytes being produced. As the degrees start to progress, the lymph nodes are going to be very, very swollen, but they're non tender. Stage 2, the liver and the spleen is very, very huge. And stage 4 is more advanced because it's now going to affect the cell lines, causing the patient to be anemic. And stage, so stage 3 and stage 4, the platelet count has already been affected, and they have low platelets known as thrombocytopenia. Well, how are we going to detect this? I already talked about it in making the diagnosis. You order a CBC, and the white blood cell count is usually between 50,000 and 200,000, and they might have anemia, thrombocytopenia, and also neutropenia are very, very common depending on how far advanced the disease is. Peripheral blood smear is how we diagnose it, and what you always see is absolute lymphocytosis. All the white blood cells are mature and they're just small lymphocytes. That is the key in a chronic lymphoblastic leukemia. When you do a peripheral blood smear, you're going to see smudge cells. Let's draw the smudge cell. This is what a smudge cell will look like. This is a smudge cell. And let's put some red blood cells around it. So red blood cells. And this is a peripheral blood smear. This is known as a smudge cell. And a smudge cell basically is a leukemic cell that's been beaten up inside the blood. And that's what a smudge cell is all about. It's just a beaten up leukemic cell. See how it's got all that, those little finger like projections on the head? Like it's basically a beaten up lymphocyte. Normal lymphocyte with like a nice round, right, with a huge nucleus, but uh, nucleus also in the middle and the cytoplasm. But unfortunately, you can see how little finger like projections on the head it has been beaten up in rags, and that's basically a smudge cell. And that is what you always see in the peripheral blood smell of patients that have CLL. And the best way to diagnose this is to do a bone marrow biopsy, right? You take the bone marrow and you see infiltrating leukemic cells inside the bone marrow. Well, we usually don't treat stage 1, 0, and stage 1 of this disease because they're asymptomatic. They have no symptoms, so they require no treatment. So you just watch the patient, but as soon as the patient starts to develop huge liver and huge spleen, or they develop anemia and thrombocytopenia, the patient is going to need chemotherapy because now the cells are going out of uh, control and now they're developing more and more symptoms. And usually the kind of chemotherapy we use, the drugs is fludarabine for treatment, fludarabine, and Chlorambucil, chlorambucil, and this has been shown to have some benefits when patients need chemotherapy in CLL. But remember, 
they're usually asymptomatic they don't need any treatment you just watch them until the disease gets worse and that brings us to the end of chronic lymphocytic leukemia now we're gonna merge to the left hand side of the board and talk about chronic myelogenous leukemia now in chronic myelogenous leukemia the most important thing we need to know is that this uh, neoplastic clonal proliferation of the myeloid stem cells the myeloid stem cell lines basically this is a cancer that's affecting the granulocytes, erythrocytes, and the platelets. Granulocytes, erythrocytes, and platelets. That's where the word myelogenous came from. Myeloid. Myeloid affects granulocytes. Remember, your granulocytes are going to become your neutrophils, which are very important to fight infections. Erythrocytes are your red blood cells that we need to make to carry oxygen to our tissues and platelets which are going to help us in blood clotting but the age where CML is often diagnosed is usually in patients around 40 years old can you see how important I kept telling age is important right Remember when we reviewed acute leukemias, less than 15 is ALL, because we all fall down. In AML, we said they're usually between 15 to 19. In CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia, it's age usually greater than 40. And once they're greater than 50, you have CLL, CLL. Now, usually, the disease for CML usually starts as a chronic form, which means an indolent form. That's how CMLs often begin, which means you're going to have it for many, many, many years. But eventually, it's going to get converted into an acute leukemia. So that's what's very interesting about CML. You have it for a very long time, and one day, bam, it's going to change to an acute leukemia, and you're going to have a blast crisis. A blast crisis, which means you're going to have an accelerated phase and a promyelocyte production. And that's usually what happens with uh, CML. So let me draw that out on the board. You're going to have it for a very long time. So for years, let's say, let's be just at 10 years, for example, right? Zero to 10 years. In one day, it's just going to progress and become, you develop a blast crisis, which you develop an acute leukemia. And remember, acute leukemias are very, very fatal because those are immature cell lines inside the bloodstream, and that's usually the progression of chronic myelogenous leukemia. Now, the Chromosome translocation. Translocation means something is translocated into another department, right? So if I have one chromosome, it's another chromosome. They cross and translocate on top of each other. And that chromosome translocation, you need to remember this, is the T translocation 922. And that is known as the Philadelphia chromosome because it was discovered in Philadelphia. This is often common, the Philadelphia chromosome is often common in 90% of patients that have CML. So always remember that, Philadelphia chromosome, CML, CML, Philadelphia chromosome. And usually patients have a shorter survival and respond poorly to treatment. Unfortunately, the prediction for survival for CML is unpredictable and is usually an average of three years. So how do we make the diagnosis of CML? Well, patients often present with no symptoms. They are asymptomatic at the time of diagnosis, and the way we actually detect this is from just routine blood work. They might have just some constitutional symptoms like fever, night sweats, some malaise, weight loss, anorexia. They're usually asymptomatic, but they might have fever, weight loss, some anorexia, 
And the problem is they're going to be having recurrent infections. Why? Because they don't have the neutrophils to fight infections, right? The neutrophils are not functioning. They're basically cancerous at this point. They're going to be anemic and they're going to have thrombocytopenia, which is going to lead them to have easy bruising, right? Bleeding of their gums, epistaxis, which is nosebleeds. Also, they will have a huge spleen and a huge liver, and they have big swollen lymph nodes. So when we make the diagnosis, when we order our lab work, we're going to see a marked leukocytosis. Marked leukocytosis, because their white blood cells is going to be between 50,000 to 200,000. Leukocytosis. So they're going to have a white count of 50,000 to 200,000 millimeters of mercury with a left shift towards granulocytes. A left shift towards granulocytes. Also, they're going to have small numbers of blast cells and promyelocytes small blast cells compared to when you have an acute leukemia you have greater than 20 percent of blast cells they're going to have eosinophilia eosinophils eosinophils presence inside their perfor uh, inside their lab work and their peripheral smear is going to have leukemic cells in the peripheral uh, blood myelocytes metamyelocytes and bands with segmental forms. Another thing you need to remember in CML is they're going to have a low alkaline phosphatase activity. Let me write that on top. Low alkaline phosphatase activity. So that's called a low ALP. And the reason is because normal neutrophils usually have a high alkaline phosphatase activity because they can actually catalyze and destroy infections and bacteria. But in this case, because the neutrophils are not really functioning, the low alkaline phosphate activity is going to be very, very low. They might have thrombocytosis. And when you do a bone marrow biopsy, you're going to see leukemic cells, leukemic cells. So how are we going to treat CML? Well, chemotherapy is going to help us control the symptoms before they migrate into this acute phase. Remember, they're going to have it for a long time, chronic. It's going to be a long time before they develop the acute form where they're going to have a lot of blast. That's why they have small blast cells when they first have the disease and they're often asymptomatic. But we want to start them on chemotherapy right away. But unfortunately, there's a uh, progressive disease actually has no cure at all. And once the patients reach a blast crisis, the disease becomes very, very terminal. So high dose chemotherapy can help bring us back into the chronic form because we don't want them to go into the acute leukemia. Also, the patient is going to need an alkylating agent, which is also going to prevent uh, the degrees progression and keep them in the chronic phase. And they're going to need bone marrow biopsy, a bone marrow and a stem cell transplant. I meant to say a bone marrow transplant may be appropriate to prevent the patients from going into acute leukemic phase. But there's a drug we can actually use now that's been approved to treat this, and it's actually a tyrosine kinase blocker known as imatinib. Imatinib. That is the treatment we're going to use to treat patients that have. Let's erase this. The drug of choice for treating CML is imatinib. And it's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. All right? And that basically brings us to the end of chronic myelogenous leukemia.